When I was younger, there were a lot of images that I was never going to live up to and that I felt like I had to live up to. I knew that I was never going to be cute and sprightly like Reese Witherspoon or sort of multicultural and beautiful like Alicia Keys. As Americans, we're more focused on losing weight than maintaining relationships and keeping you know, healthy families together. And I know, you know, people from my high school are like, wow, everyone around is so pretty. Like, how are they like that? And I know personally that half of them are not healthy. Probably most of them are not healthy. They either don't eat right, they exercise too much, they do drugs to be skinny. One thing I've had to struggle with my body has always been size. Like, I've always, like, even back in high school, you know, like, I always wanted to play football, but my dad said I was too short for it, too small. The first thing the nurse did was give me a form that said consent to chemotherapy. And the first thing I thought of was not my health or what was going to happen to me internally, but it was, am I going to lose my hair? I can compare myself to my friends who have like tight butts, small legs, like big boobs. And I can compare myself to these women on TV. And I feel like I'm kind of trying to live up to a standard, like I'm trying to be someone that society wants me to be. It's easier for a male to cover up what he's struggling with than it is for a woman, just because those questions aren't asked. 34, 24, 34 waist, hips, and breast size. Um, it's very an unattainable figure. I mean, I even when I was in the modeling industry in my prime, um, I didn't have those body measurements. So I was always struggling when I was 118 pounds to be thinner. And I missed out on a lot of things that um, would have been a lot of fun, um, but I just didn't go because there was a dinner involved or, um, I, I don't know, I wanted to go to the gym instead. It, it was, um, there were a lot of low points. <laughs>
I asked my collaborators to identify one image that exemplifies the U.S. cultural ideal for the female body. Here are some examples they chose. And here are some descriptors they used. The cultural ideal in the U.S. for the female body is... Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Sports Illustrated Magazine, the Swimsuit Edition. Victoria's Secret Model. Victoria's Secret Models. Victoria's Secret Model. Victoria's Secret Model. Victoria's Secret Model. Flawless skin, really large breasts, big breasts, big boobs. Like a Barbie image? It's kind of like Barbie. Definitely not overweight. Slender. Slender, definitely slender. She's thin. 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 She's very thin. So thin. She's stick thin. Like a dead skeleton coming down the runway at you. I also asked my collaborators to identify an image that exemplifies the U.S. cultural ideal for the male body. Here are some of those examples. And here are some of their descriptors. He's got a really athletic, lean build. He's got an athletic build. Sculpted and 2% body fat. Buff and big. Muscular. 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 He's very muscular. He's very muscular. Like very muscular. The muscles. Muscles. 185 pounds of raw muscle. When we scratch the surface of what prettier means, we find that we might as well be saying whiter or more gentile. I feel like Beyonce represents the cultural ideal, at least to myself, because she is a thin woman, but she's curvaceous, and she has an athletic physique, which I feel like is more obtainable, but I definitely think she has the pressures to conform to be like more white, the whiteness of beauty. Um, so she is an African-American woman, but she's white in a sense, how she has the straight hair and like the lighter skin color. Beyonce is attractive, one because I think she has a really great personality, but two because she sort of has a body type that can't quite be categorized. It's not sort of the traditional view of what an African American woman's body looks like, but it doesn't necessarily fit into the mold of sort of the stick thin figure. So people sort of embrace her curves, but her curves aren't that drastic. It's obvious that uh, the white female is a lot more, I guess, mainstream than an ethnic female would be. Um, we have made a lot of progress, but not to an extent where I feel like it would represent what women try to attain. And I think even um, ethnic youth, I feel like they would more look up to a white female and the successes of a white female than they would an ethnic female in that position. On which side of the tracks do I belong? Ideal beauty, ideal food. Which side of the tracks is ideal? Is it the white side or the black side? Is it the skinny side or the curvaceous side? Is it the grilled chicken side or the fried chicken side? Is it the model skinny side or the athletic thick side? Is it the diet food side or the soul food side? Is it the hate your body side or the embrace your body side? Is it my mom's side or my dad's side? Is there any side at all? On which side of the tracks do I belong? Being a model and working in the modeling industry, a lot of the beauty norms and ideals are the white beauty ideal, to be thin, to be tall, to have straight, beautiful hair. So I've been on that side of the track for a long time, on the white side of the track, and struggling with my black side as well because my dad's black and like it's more accepting of bodies. I do have curves. So I'm kind of struggling, you know, am I on the white side or am I on the black side? or I'm on the side that I don't have a side. I'm in the middle of the track. I'm not quite sure, so I was trying to express that struggle, that internal struggle, and also um, external struggle with which side of the track do I belong on.
All summer I had been searching the web and stores for a perfect pair of brown wedges. The first night I wore them out, the slippery floor, and I just turned the wrong way and went down in my heels. After thinking it was just going to be a little sprain and my ankle was still huge, so I decided to go to urgent care. The doctor comes in, tells me I have a broken leg. You're going to have to cast for six weeks, you're going to be on crutches. So that started off my senior year with a bang. One of the most radical body projects is cosmetic surgery. Popular television has helped normalize cosmetic surgery. Doctors perform between 10 and 11 million cosmetic procedures each year. The most common non-surgical procedure is botulinum toxin, Botox. The most common surgical procedure is breast augmentation. Over the summer, I was I went to my gynecologist to get some checkups and I was kind of concerned that, that my boobs weren't the same size and I was kind of hoping that one day they would change and become the same size and she was like, you know, this is the time where it's going to be the same size now, it's not going to, they're not going to grow anymore. And I was kind of bummed because my grandma's double D, my older sister is a full C and my younger sister is a D. And so I was like, well, I just got gypped on those jeans and my gynecologist was she looked at my boobs and she kind of like stepped back and was shocked a little and was like, oh, they are very different. And I was like, oh, well, that's not something you want to hear from your gynecologist every day. And so she was like, I mean, why not get boob implants? One of my best friends, um, she's always been big busted. And um, one day I kind of went with her to go get a training bra for her. And I kind of realized that I was different from all my other friends because I didn't need one yet. When I got to high school, it kind of all hit me that like I really wanted to get um, a breast augmentation. So um, basically, what I did was I asked my parents for it because it just was like difficult, like feeling like I, you know, wasn't feminine enough because I didn't have breasts and like kind of guys looked at me like I was a tomboy, and I just wanted to feel feminine. And so I asked my mom if I could get a breast augmentation when I was for graduation from high school and she looked at me like I was crazy. Half my family is Jewish so my mom's side they all have the you know a Jewish nose so my mom when she was going to high school her mom let her get a nose job. My mom like mentioned it to me because I had been saying how much I didn't like it compared to everyone else and um, how it would change my life if I got it done and I would be much happier. I remember it was yeah the summer before um, my ninth grade um, year in high school just you know and I was like I want to start fresh you know um, going to high school like you know feeling confident and so that summer I made up this story that I got hit um, with the boom of a sailboat because I was at sailing camp. <laughs> Once you start telling people that you got hit with a boom of a sailboat and broke your nose, like you start believing it. Like if you tell, because I told no one. I was introduced to a new concept in uh, a course I'm taking this semester uh, that's called muscle dysmorphia. When 
looking into body ideals, I feel like there's a lot of concentration that go along with women. And uh, I actually feel like men are neglected in their problems, uh, especially when it comes to eating disorders and body image ideal. So what I did was I found this image. It was originally an ad for uh, Vitamin Smart Water, changing the ad from being about water to being about what men struggle with, and that's trying to have the male ideal uh, image. And in doing so, a lot of men succumb to the pressures of um, resorting to using steroids and uh, working out excessively, unnecessarily, and in an unhealthy manner. It's all of these really intense, overpowering, ultra-masculine um, phrases like who's the big guy at the gym and ferocious and you know uh, awaken the beast and muscle and power and it's these bodies that are literally taken to the most extreme that we could ever imagine. It's almost like we're trying to get more muscular and the more steroid stuff that comes out, pro hormones, all these supplements, it's like guys are trying to get even bigger and I think it's just to the point where you know it's getting absurd. It's, it's ridiculous. I got to go to the gym. Gotta go to the gym, gotta get my tan, gotta walk around with my chest puffed out. Big dick, big dick. I'm so tired of that. Gazing in the mirror at my emaciated body, I observed a woman held up by her culture as a physical ideal because she was starving, self-obsessed, and powerless. A woman called beautiful because she threatened no one except herself. And the quote says it perfectly because they're not only giving up their health, they're not only giving up their mental health, but they're also giving up whichever uh, little bit of power that, that women have strived to gain uh, through so many years now. I feel like it's a step back for women. was put in gymnastics at a really young age and for me everyone around it, surrounded by me were gymnasts and everyone was super thin and in shape and our coaches were always saying lighter, jumps higher, flies better, gets a better score. By the time I was 14 years old my diet consisted of a hundred calorie pack, an apple, and a chocolate milk every single day for two years with working out at the gym about 12 hours a day between cheerleading practice and a nine hours a week at the gymnastics gym. For me, this was normal. I was 5'2 and 84 pounds, but all through high school, I was exactly the same height I am today, but about 20 pounds lighter. Like, I never thought I had an eating disorder, and I never thought anything was wrong, until one day when I had a bad accident and I hurt my ankle, and I hurt my ankle in gym class and found out that I could no longer do gymnastics anymore. And the first thought that came to my head was, oh my God, I'm gonna gain weight. What, can I, what am I gonna do? The anorexic may begin her journey defiant, but from the point of view of a male-dominated society, she ends up as the perfect woman. She is weak, sexless, and voiceless, and can only with difficulty focus on a world beyond her plate. The woman has been killed off in her. She is almost not there. I began um, with my dieting very defiant, and people told me that I shouldn't bother because I would never be a size zero. And so I saw that as a challenge, and I never backed down from a challenge. As the pounds went off and as my clothes got smaller, I felt really good and, and, and strong, and like I, I'm doing something that people said I couldn't do. But then I, I was, very weak and I couldn't make any decisions and I, I was cold and tired all the time. I didn't want to spend any time with anyone. I didn't want to do anything, I, even my studies. Afterwards, I realized now how much time I wasted on something so stupid. All that energy, if I had put it towards anything else, I could have done so much. And um, it just really becomes a lie to yourself that you're being rebellious and defiant when really you're just laying down and letting the world tell you what to do. I 
started looking at magazine covers and what they said, what they were trying to tell us, the messages that they were trying to send us. And when I got to the Women's Health magazine, I found that every main title had to do with body image and had to do with dieting and had to do with toning your abs. And if you look into the health, you can see the title say, flat sexy abs and like look great naked, but what does that have to do with health? What is not acknowledged is the extreme fat prejudice in Western society and the intolerance for a diversity of sizes and shapes that may drive women and girls to extreme behaviors to avoid discrimination. There is an intolerance on this campus for different sizes and different shapes, but I think a lot of that is just ignorance. We see all these images in the media of females who have no fat on their bodies and we think that there's something wrong with us if we have that fat. Overweight is inherently anti-fat. It implies an extreme goal. Instead of a bell curve distribution of human weights, it calls for a lone, towering, unlikely bar graph with everyone occupying the same thin weights. I have always been called overweight ever since I was a kid and uh, it used to bother me, in some ways it still does, but the quote really struck me because I've never really thought what the implications of being overweight is. Using that term versus using fat or obese or any other term was still inherently implying that I was less than the hegemonic norm, that I was unpreferred or unacceptable. Anti-fat prejudice is the most socially acceptable form of prejudice in the U.S. today. Partners, family members, friends, and even strangers on the street seem remarkably unrestrained about policing the bodies of those the culture deems overweight. This prejudice makes its way into every social institution. US, we are obsessed with weight and weight loss. Obesity, we are told, has reached, quote, epidemic proportions. Not only does childhood obesity lead to chronic diseases later in life, military leaders say it's a national security threat. How in the world can you be normal weight and yet obese at the same time? If you think you're sagging, consider Obi the obese stocks hunt. And there's this, what one writer today called a depressing sign of America's obesity problem, fatter crash test dummies. According to the dominant narrative, Having a body the culture deems overweight is unquestionably a problem. Most of us have passively accepted that narrative as true. But what if obesity is not a problem in the ways we've been led to believe? Intellectually, we know that just because a person looks overweight by cultural standards doesn't mean that person must be unhealthy. Indeed, that person could be a champion, athlete. Intellectually, we know that just because a person's body might be close to the cultural ideal doesn't mean that person must be healthy. Indeed, she could be struggling with anorexia. He could be seeking out another cycle of steroids. So what is the relationship between weight and health? According to Paul Ernsberger, after we control for socioeconomic status, for all the stresses and vulnerabilities that come with being poor, there is no significant increase in risk of death from high body mass. Still, we internalize the narrative that high body mass is a problem, specifically an individual problem, eating too much of the wrong kinds of foods and getting insufficient exercise. 
Consumer culture then offers a range of solutions to the problem of being, quote, overweight. Despite billions of dollars and decades of research, all the so-called developments and new techniques, the failure rate for sustained weight loss has remained remarkably constant, between 90 and 95 percent. None of this is to suggest that we shouldn't attend to what we eat and how much we exercise. Health is associated with eating nutrient-dense foods and engaging in regular physical activity. But our focus needs a radical shift from weight loss as an end in itself to health, personal health, and social health. A lot of times when people look at those considered overweight or obese, they think that is someone who is sitting around playing video games or eating cheeseburgers and drinking milkshakes and doing nothing with their lives. I think that's such a sort of privileged perspective uh, to have on why people's bodies end up the way that they are. I think that genetics definitely come into play, but when we look at the food that we consume as a society, um, there are so many other constraints in our lives that sometimes the only thing people can afford to eat is off the dollar menu at McDonald's. My collaborators and I came to understand that on this issue and a host of other issues related to the current food system, we all know far too little. Tyson Foods takes leftover chicken meat and skin and intestines from its poultry slaughterhouses, ships them to Tyson feed plants, adds them to chicken feed, and then provides the feed to Tyson growers so that baby chicks can eat their ancestors. There's a disconnect between many consumers and what they're eating. Some people just don't want to know about what they're eating, you know, where it comes from, but I really think it's important that we educate ourselves what we're putting into our bodies. And then I see a few hind legs still kicking, a final reflex action, and the reality comes hard and clear. I know when I'm eating meat that it came from a live animal, but just to think about the last few seconds where, where it's still alive or the seconds right afterwards where there's still some motion going on, I think that's just a really you know, troubling image in my head because when I look at meat, I don't think like, oh, it's just packaged stuff that I bought in the store. This actually came from like a slaughterhouse. I guess I realized that these type of practices occurred, but not until I actually read the words and like spoke them out loud did I actually think about how inhumane and sad the practice of some of the food we eat it really is. Once a company has decided voluntarily to pull contaminated meat from the market, it is under no legal obligation to inform the public or even state health officials that a recall is taking place. I felt pretty strongly about this quote. Um, I actually felt pretty strongly about the entire book and reading Fast Food Nation. Uh, just to see how much capitalism has actually affected um, something as important or simple as sustenance. By any means, if the Monsanto seed gets into something, it owns and controls it. And so that just made me think, like, if you look at the progress of time, if I grew up eating processed foods, and while I'm pregnant, I am eating processed foods, my baby is going to come out a product of Monsanto. And um, so that's what I was trying to portray here is, I mean, <laughs> they might as well come out of a corn husk, right? <laughs> Every day in the United States, roughly 200,000 people are sickened by a foodborne disease, 900 are hospitalized, and 14 die. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, more than a quarter of the American population suffers a bout of food poisoning each year. Most of these cases are never reported to authorities or properly diagnosed. The widespread outbreaks that are detected and identified represent a small fraction of the number that actually occurs. It's such a spectrum of like some people are dying because they're not eating anything, and some people are dying because they are eating but the food is filled with pesticides. While some individuals can reduce our risk of consuming tainted food, that solution is not available to all, as Stephen demonstrates with his digital art project. And so what I'm trying to say is that to get really good, healthy, organic food right now in this country, it's way, it's almost crazily expensive. Even like 
a middle class family would have an extremely hard time living off that diet. Food inequality manifests in other ways as well. A study recently released by the USDA estimates that between production and end use, more than a quarter of the food produced in the United States goes to waste. I think it's unbelievable with how many poor families we have and how many people are struggling to survive and just to put dinner on their table, yet so much of the food we produce doesn't go to anyone, and why is that? According to Janet Poppendike, while canned food drives and hunger walks may fill a critical short-term need, they also undermine more structural solutions to food inequality. Long-term private charity helps the privileged feel generous more than it helps the hungry gain reliable access to nutritious food. We do so many food drives, we do so many like feed the homeless, make sandwiches to hand out to homeless people, and I feel like those small changes makes it gives the illusion that we are making a difference and that there is no issue because we're taking care of it, but I think that masks what the more structural, structural problem is and prevents any change occurring at the institutional level and um, it kind of keeps the people in power and control and gives them an excuse not to make any changes. So here are some action items from my collaborators and me. Practice unplugging from corporate media and advertising and encourage your family and friends to do the same. There is an inverse relationship between consumption of images featuring body ideals and your own body esteem. The more body ideal images you consume, the worse you will feel about your body. Confront anti-fat prejudice in yourself and others. Refrain from commenting on your own and other size. Even casual comments like, oh, I feel so fat in this, and looks like she put on a few pounds, can deeply impact those around you. Interrupt harassment and bullying based on body shape and size. For some young people, weight-based bullying produces such self-hatred and hopelessness that they commit suicide. Anti-fat prejudice is a matter of public health and social justice. In the realm of food, do your homework. Know where your food comes from. Buy organic if you can. Organic food is produced with far fewer harmful chemicals. Buy local when you can. On average, a food item travels 2,000 miles to reach your plate. Local food tends to have a much lower carbon footprint. If you are serious about reducing your own carbon footprint, here's the single most important change you can make. Eat less meat. It takes enormous quantities of water, grain, and petrochemicals to grow chicken, pork, and beef. If you consider access to nutrient-dense food and to safe environments conducive to activity and play to be human rights, as the makers of this video do, contribute your time, energy, and money to raising the minimum wage, to increasing regulatory control over food producers, and to expanding public nutrition support programs. When it comes to how we relate to our own bodies, to others' bodies, and to food, we have a lot of work to do. This is about power, but it's also about human rights, and that puts us, you and me, on the side of dignity, compassion, and justice. The movement is underway. Do what my collaborators have done and keep the conversation going.
going. This was my second creative analytic piece and I wanted to do something with mirrors because we talked a lot about women and how they see themselves in the mirror and there's always the talk about how when you're anorexic or bulimic you'll look in the mirror and not see who actually is there. So I wrote fat in the mosaic mirror tile so if you are far enough away and you look into it you can actually see yourself but it's really chopped up. And then I took a black 3D paint and I wrote, did you ever stop and think that maybe it's the mirror that's broken and not you. I think before I took this course, I never really understood why anyone would want to be a vegetarian. And I always just thought it was kind of natural for other animals to eat other animals. But um, once I learned about how food is actually produced and all the unethical practices that go along with it, it's really changed my view. I have had a transformation and a bit of a journey as to how I see my body. but. On the day-to-day -day basis, I think when I look in the mirror, I see something I like, something that I find attractive. Breaking my leg and being disabled for 10 weeks on crutches just totally changed my viewpoint. I realized that our bodies are gifts and we need to appreciate that gift and take care of it and love it and feed it the right things and not wear absurdly large, absurdly tall heels. And I feel like if I were to get cosmetic surgery, I feel like it could be just a mistake on my identity because I want to be who I am. I don't want to be perceived as someone else and me with big boobs, I can't see it. <laughs> Honestly, these body ideals make people think they have to create some aspiration that they're never going to attain. We don't want that, man. It's quite simple, you know, like fake breasts aren't going to hold my hand in the morning with coffee. I'm really happy with my body and who I am and I definitely think that not getting a breast augmentation was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. It definitely made me change my perspective of how I look at myself and how I have to be healthy and not thin and not with a head full of hair. And I remember the first time I went home winter break, my gymnast I walked into my gymnastics gym and they said lose five pounds and I looked at them and looked at myself and I said and I just looked at their faces and I said, I'm not a gymnast anymore. Before, um, I couldn't see myself doing anything else other than acting. And that's why it freaked me out so much when they told me that if I didn't lose weight, I wouldn't be able to do it. And now, I would really be happy working at a nonprofit, helping other people um, live better lives, changing the world for the better. I, I just think that if I knew that I made the world a better place for other people, that would what else is there, you know, like what could be more important?